Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this evening's session of um, our seminar. It is the what has become a very, very popular uh, way to spend your evening. Um, to be part of the UGBS uh, Practitioner Seminar Series in which we seek to disrupt thoughts, to reconstruct thoughts in the process, shape um, uh, um, policy and practice. Um, as you remember, yesterday there was a session. Uh, this evening, I, am, I have the singular honor to host yet another session. Um, this evening session is uh, being led by the Department of uh, Accounting uh, here in the uh, business school. Um, so if there are people who you know should be here who are not here, you should prompt them that we are airborne. Um, this evening we have some very um, exciting sessions we want to uh, discuss all of that in the accounting discipline. I'm sorry. Um, the first presenter I am going to be introducing uh, very soon. Um, we 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 became acquaintances to each other a while ago, uh, I think last year or two years ago, uh, before I became dean. So uh, the way the politicians will say, fit, 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 fit. we knew each other, I better start today. So um, our colleague is Dr. George um, Keba, um, uh, who is an assistant professor of accounting and finance uh, at the Quinnipiac University of Business in Hamdan, Connecticut. At his university, he teaches courses in accounting, finance, management information systems, and, and supervises a broad range of students and topics. He's the founder of the K GKB, GKB Partners, uh, and this is a group of chartered accountants and management consultants, which focus on accounting and auditing services, financial fraud investigation, as for forensic accounting, internal control development, monitoring and evaluation, as well as business process improvements. Prior to GKB um, partners, uh, Professor Ban was the Director of Financial Reporting and Tax Integration at the uh, Hewlett uh, Hackett Group uh, Incorporated in Miami. He has extensive financial reporting and management consulting experience, having worked in Ghana, in the UK and in the US with major organizations such as Lloyd's and Twitch, uh, Prudential Financial and Wells Real Estate Funds. Professor Ban is the chairman of the ACCA USA Membership Network, a 4,200 member association. He serves as the ACCA's International Assembly. He serves on the ACCA's International Assembly uh, which is ACA leadership group focused on improving accounting and, uh, and the profession of accounting. Uh, ACCA's Global Audit Assurance Forum and ACCA's Global Education Forum. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know that we are dealing with a colossus in the discipline of accounting. Professor Ban earned his PhD in management from Cape Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. He is a chartered accountant and a certified public accountant with licenses to practice accountancy in the United States and the United Kingdom. Professor Ban is a product of the University of Professional Studies. Ah, oh, you should have, you should have. This, this profile is definitely from UG. Uh, so, okay, we would allow them. They are our, they are our noisy neighbors. So we would allow them uh, a little bit of shine. It, it's good, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> I was always, I was always a, uh, a product of University of Ghana Business School that I saw UPSA. Well, UPSA is a fine university. They train a lot of uh, accounting professionals. Uh, <laughs> as um, a section chair in numerous academic conferences in the United States and, uh, and the Europe. In addition to his teaching responsibilities, he is the faculty advisor of the Beta Alpha Society at Quinnipiac University an organization that focuses on developing professional accountants. He is a member of the All Nations Church in Atlanta and Tessano Baptist Church in Accra. 
it is my extreme honor this evening to introduce to you Professor George Ma, who will be talking to us. And I am excited about the topic he's talking about because that's what he's, he goes around the world doing. So he's talking to us about COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 on accounting profession and education. Um, so Professor George Ma, you, you are welcome. We are all ears to listen to you. You have up to 30 minutes or so to give us your presentation it will be followed by a q a uh, i want to encourage colleagues to write your questions in the chat room so we can read it to prof as he goes on the presentation so you don't forget your question but prof you are extremely uh, and warmly welcome to this session we are happy to see you please take over sir all right um that was um a very nice introduction. I really appreciate that. And I'm also very excited to be speaking to uh, my family members and friends in Ghana about accounting, the profession itself, and also um, about uh, the education side. Because without a good education side, we can't have a good professional side. And without a good professional side, we can't have a good educational side. So I'm very excited to be speaking about um, accounting education and the profession itself. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, you should be able. Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So, and I edited the, the uh, topic a little bit just to add a little meat to it. Let's give it a second. Let this thing load. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, the, the, this is how uh, things are going to roll. Uh, I'll talk about the uh, eruption of COVID and what it did to, or what the immediate uh, situations that followed right after the COVID came up. And of course, um, once COVID came and we found out what it was, uh, it caused a lot of disruptions. Uh, it caused a lot of disruptions in multiple levels of uh, the accounting profession and training in general. But at the same time, there were a lot of responses. And then uh, as a result of the disruptions and the responses that came, I'm going to try to, uh, based on discussions that I've had with people, within the uh, industry, uh, talk about what the future direction looks like and what opportunities exist that uh, those of us in the training side of it uh, may take advantage of or prepare for it. So uh, without further ado, I'll just start. So uh, sometime in March, actually it was February, when we started hearing about the COVID. By the time we heard that it was in China. And then, um, just before our spring break, uh, it started getting more and more serious. And fortunately for us, uh, just around that time, our students went on spring break. Our spring break is a week. So when they went, the announcement came back that um, we have to shut everything down. So when the COVID erupted, basically everything ceased at the same time. So we had physical business operations basically ceased. You couldn't go to a restaurant. You couldn't go to the store. Only a few stores were open. And then our students went home. We were told, they were told not to come back. So we had on-ground instruction ceasing. Uh, of course, uh, when students are told to go home, boarding activities also cease. And we had to resort to technology for instructioning and uh, administrative activities where possible. Not everything could be used or could be done uh, using technology. So um, in this section, what I try to do is try to identify the various areas of disruptions. So I start with uh, the institution itself. Uh, what happened with the schools? There were major uh, disruptions in academic plan uh, because school uh, instruction had to cease. Uh, several things also had to change. Uh, we had to change um, semester plan, graduation plans, uh, student leaving campus, all of those have to change. And then we also had to change course planning. 
um, there were certain courses that could continue and there were certain courses that could not continue. Certain courses, especially courses that require practical and physical presence. Uh, a lot of the medical schools could not really train their people because they couldn't go to the morgue to do the type of training that they had to, they, they are supposed to be doing. Um, and even things like the type of grading method that you have to use uh, in a virtual environment, all these things became very um, destructive. Um, so the question became, what do we do about uh, teaching? Because we couldn't meet students anymore, and that was also a problem. And then um, even faculty recruitment, schools had lined up people, getting them ready uh, to hire them, all of that had to cease. And then we also had, because students had to leave boarding, uh, we had budgetary disruptions. Uh, money that the schools thought they were going to get uh, from students staying in boarding houses, all of them uh, had to basically be changed because students were not on campus anymore. Now, so at the, this is what happened at the institutional level. And of course, when things happen at the institutional level, it affects teachers as well. So uh, as, as a professor or as a teacher in accounting environment, uh, one of the things that we know is that accounting is always very difficult uh, for a lot of students because uh, most of it, most of the people don't even know what it is. So you have to find a way to make it very easy for them or manageable for them. And so if we are not meeting them face to face, then it creates a lot of uh, problems. So uh, cost planning. Um, some of the questions were whether we change the syllabus or not change the syllabus. It was necessary for us to change the syllabus. Um, the type of grading plan again. Um, and I'll get into the responses, uh, but some of the questions that we were even thinking about was how do we design the grading? Do we make the questions tough and make the grading easy or make the questions easy and make the grading tough? All these things were problems that uh, we were dealing with in the middle of the semester. It's easy when these things happen, when school is in recession, uh, sorry, is when school is in recess, then you can plan well. But you've already, we had already started the semester. And then when it came to delivery, deli uh, delivery um, we're thinking about synchronous and asynchronous uh, teaching. Do you just record this class and have your students listen to it? Or you have to meet them live online, just like what we're doing. And if you do it that way, what impact is that going to have? So student engagement became a very uh, tricky thing to manage. So all these things were things that we were, um, everybody was up in arms about trying to work around it. And then the students themselves, um, because ultimately it comes to the student being able to learn. And so the student themselves uh, had a lot of issues. Uh, one of them was basically um, how they were going to attend class and be able to achieve the, um, grace that they want to achieve. Um, some of the students were very worried about missing time with their friends. Um, some are uh, athletes. They love, they live and die by participating in the athletic uh, events that they are part of. And uh, that was also a worry. And then, uh, especially for our school, internships are part of the uh, course. And we have students who were very concerned about their intention prospects, whether they were going to get a chance to go in or not. So, and then they, 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 some of the students were actually very concerned about their overall future, whether they were going to be able to graduate or not. And so all these were uh, things that basically just popped up out of uh, the COVID. But uh, I can't talk about schools and students and teaching without talking about the business community because the business community is what we our uh, students go in. So I'll talk briefly about them. Um, businesses were equally affected because uh, one of the things that they were mainly worried about was whether they, would, they will be able to continue their businesses uh, as they've been asked to go back home. Some were worried about losing their customers. Um, and of course, losing customers go with also losing uh, revenue. And then the other thing was uh, product delivery, how they were going to service their clients. Um, tax services, financial accounting, management accounting, those were not much of a major concern. What I have heard as I've been traveling through 
uh, talking to different people is the issue of auditing. Uh, auditing was a, ma a major issue because um, it's mainly something that you have to do client facing. And if you're not doing the client facing, then it can be a major issue as well. And then um, some of them, so um, especially here in America, the first quarter is where almost every company is putting together their financials. And the COVID happened in March. So that disrupted a lot of hiring. Uh, companies that had you know, hiring plans in place to hire people to um, help with their COVID, uh, sorry, to help with their financial reporting, had to put them on, a, you know, on hold. Companies had to postpone major capital investment plans that they had. And then um, because a lot of people were not necessarily prepared for this, uh, spending on technology became a very tricky thing. And the question was always, do I buy this major technology for this short period or buy it and use it long term? In, and so all these were disruptions that um, people experienced. And then to the individual accountants, they were so, everybody was, uh, again, very concerned. People were worried about losing income because of uh, potential layoffs and uh, fellows. Um, people were working remote. And as, as I mentioned before, one of the issues was people who worked in auditing. The idea of not being able to face your client was a major issue about the quality of audits that it could uh, probably put out. And then this is a topic that's or a question that's been going on and on and on. So uh, some of the accountants that I've spoken to were actually worried that when companies invest so much in technology, technology is going to take away their profession. So the fear of losing their profession to technology, such as artificial intelligence, actually rose as, as a result of this COVID issue. Um, and then for those who didn't have, who didn't necessarily worry about technology, uh, they realized that you have to perform much of your work remotely at home on a computer. Uh, realizing that technology is going to be very needed, a lot of questions that has come from accountants is what type of technology do we have to invest in? What do we have to know in order to be able to survive in this new technology heavy accounting environment. So I'll talk a little bit about responses that basically came in. And uh, when I talked about the disruptions, I didn't talk about um, the role or the impact on regulatory bodies. But in this particular case, I want to just mention them a little. Uh, so regulatory bodies, um, generally their responses were, I don't know, I won't call it formal collaboration, but it was very consistent across. So I call it informal collaboration. But basically what they did was they decided they, they made an effort to accommodate their, um, their members. Example of that is a PCOB, uh, Public Company uh, Accounting Oversight Board. Um, instead of adhering to their deadlines, their in the inspection deadlines, they decided to give their members grace period of about 45 days in order to allow them to prepare. Um, SEC did something similar. They allowed their membership to, um, they have some type of grace period uh, in terms of filing their reports. But that was just the near term. What I've seen in the long term is that uh, the regulators have come to see that technology in education is here to stay in general. So for example, if you look at uh, most of the IASB's uh, June 2020 papers, they're all around involving technology and getting ready for uh, situations such as the COVID. Um, with this abrupt stoppage of business uh, has also raised this issue of going concern uh, because the going concern methods that we know uh, take into consideration the future revenue of the organization. Now, if you have an organization that's not generating any revenue for almost 100 days, how do you say whether the company is going to be a going concern or it's not going to be a going concern in the near future? So that has raised a lot of issues about uh, going concern. There are actually um, exposure drafts and development papers on this particular issue. So that's on the regulatory side. And uh, from the account, professional accounting bodies, uh, in the near term, again, they also try to accommodate their membership. Uh, a good example is ACCA. What ACCA did right away 
was cancel the June exams in certain regions. And in addition to that, they reduced the uh, CPD requirement for 2020, okay? But in the long term, what they have also come to realize is that, as I mentioned, technology is, is here to stay. It's part of counting education. So ACC, again, for example, is offering courses in data analytics and uh, machine learning uh, for their members. Uh, I think it was a month ago that I saw that the AICPA is also proposing incorporating data analytics and other technology in their academic program. In addition to that, not just um, the uh, data analytics that's being offered, ACCA is actually going further to do virtual supervision of their, some of their exam centers so that, you know, whether there's a COVID or not, you can still take your exams and be supervised remotely uh, using technology. So all these are developments that have come uh, on the market as a result of the COVID. Uh, what academic institutions, uh, or what it did, was one of them, the first thing was maximize utilization of whatever uh, technology that we have. Um, for my school, for example, um, we moved all our activities online and exams activities online. Uh, we had accounting exams that we used to, that used to be paper and pencil, and we had to move all, move all of them online. In addition to that, uh, schools have had to invest in new technology uh, fortunately for us, we had Zoom already. We had already, uh, we had Zoom last semester and we all trained on Zoom. So when it became an issue, uh, uh, it wasn't an issue for us at all. We already knew how to use Zoom. But in the long term, schools, what I see schools doing is that schools are adopting different methods of course delivery. Uh, what a COVID has taught us is that you don't necessarily have to be in a physical classroom to be able to do the learning that you're doing. So what we're seeing with schools in terms of what's gonna happen in the next semester is what they call this high flex model, for example, where some of the courses can be delivered online and some of the courses can be delivered uh, in class. Uh, what us also uh, the COVID has shown is that it looks like enrollment in the coming years are going to be much lower than anticipated. So it's causing a lot of budgetary issues that company, uh, schools are actually paying attention to. So it uh, looks like some pro programs may be uh, cut back or pulled back uh, until enrollment improves. And then schools are also using uh, you know, new techniques to recruit students. Uh, in America, to get in a college, you need SAT or ACT. Uh, there are some schools that have actually waived the requirement, the SAT and ACT requirement for next year, so that students uh, who will say, okay, we couldn't take the exam because of COVID, we just still get inside uh, a university. So basically what some of those schools are going to do is use the student's GPA from their high school as a recruitment uh, qualification, okay? From the, inspectors, uh, from the instructor's perspective, um, what we had to do in the near term is, again, make things flexible for our students. One of the easiest things for us, and including myself, was to uh, make due dates a little more flexible, basically just accommodate your students. But one of the most issues, the, the most uh, difficult issues, at least for some of us, was making sure that we stayed, uh, we were able to engage our students. Um, for, to, to be able to engage the students, you have to choose which approach to use in terms of the delivery. Um, one thing was to, uh, to make sure that students were answering questions and were actually not just locked in, but they were actually uh, active participants in the class. So uh, at least on my side, what I did was I issued a lot of practical questions. And I could just call you and say, hey, what is this? What is the answer to this? And I expect you to respond right away. Oh, one of the things that I actually did, instead of muting everybody as we're talking, all my students asked everybody to leave their mic open. And it was because I, I sort of understood the culture in my classroom when we met physically, and I wanted the online meeting to mimic that. Uh, my students have the tendency to ask questions without raise, raising their hands. And that actually became an asset when we came online because I said, okay, unmute yourself, and if I say something that you don't 
you don't understand, don't wait and raise, don't raise your hand and wait till I see it. Unmute yourself and ask a question right away. So by the second meeting, our virtual classroom was almost like our uh, in-class meeting, and that was very helpful. And I think that going forward, that these are things that I expect that we will be, uh, we'll continue to use. Uh, flexible assessments. Um, the school was very kind to us. Uh, instead of having to score 90% to get an A, uh, we're giving, in some cases, we're given a choice to just do a pass or fail or use the standard grading. So that was very good for us. And then I think what's going to happen as we go forward is that uh, we're, the design of accounting courses will have to include a lot more technology. So data analytics, internet of things, artificial intelligence, all these are things that I expect to see uh, in an accounting uh, curriculum design. Uh, students, of course, they always wanted to, their response was to make things to make sure that uh, things were much easier for them. Uh, the business community, what, is, what I see, or uh, the responses that I saw in here is uh, the revamp technology use uh, and remote work. Uh, they allow their employees to work remotely and uh, they were very kind to a lot of students who had uh, been offered internship. The only thing is that instead of having a four week internship, uh, most of the students got a two-week internship. And the two-week internship was also remote, but at least the students got an internship. So that was also um, a very good one. So we've seen the level of disruptions and also the responses that were given uh, by the various organizations and entities within the accounting structure. Um, what do I think is going to happen? I think this is where a lot of discussions are going to happen. Uh, what I think is going to happen in the future is that the first thing is that technology and accounting is here to stay, whether we like it or not. And so we definitely need to embrace it, okay? But um, I put a few things here. Uh, there are actually eight points that I raised. The first thing is that the normal brick and mortar universities that we've seen, uh, I expect that to change not just for the COVID, just this COVID period, but what uh, the, the uh, shutting down of schools and the COVID issue has shown us is that you don't have to be in a classroom to learn everything. And so I expect that to change quite a bit. Um, I expect that schools will be offering both on ground and actually they'll be offering online courses to some of their on ground students. Uh, this is something that I think is going to happen. Um, and one of the issues that we're going to have to deal with uh, as brick and mortar schools will be the budgetary implication. Uh, why should I come to a university and pay $50,000 for something that I can uh, get or for education that I can get on, let's say, Coursera, which already have the courses recorded? Uh, so we have to look at our value proposition as to why somebody has to come into a brick and mortar school to come and pay hefty amounts of money to get something that they can get online. Um, I expect to see organizational resilience activities to increase. So organizational planning, business continuity planning, uh, course design, all these I expect them to increase. Again, because when the COVID happened, uh, a lot of companies uh, were caught pants down. Some didn't have enough reserves uh, for a situation like this. So I expect that companies are going to start paying attention to them. And one of those uh, things or one of those resources they will need is FP&A professionals, financial planning and analysis professionals, uh, who would look at how money comes in, how money leaves, and what reserves can be put away uh, in the event of a situation like the COVID. Okay. And then I think that, um, I don't know how to put it, but the days of taking and tying for uh, low grade accounting professionals is totally gone. I don't expect, uh, if oh, I'll put it this way, if you're an accounting professional and you have not upgraded your skills, then at some point you're not going to be relevant because um, what the COVID did was that it caused companies to invest heavily in technology. And what technology is doing is that the processes that can easily be automated are being automated. So if you're a paper pushing type of professional, 
uh, then might be a good time for you to upgrade your skills. Otherwise, you are going to be made irrelevant. And I think that is where things are going. So uh, high quality things, uh, accountants for will be needed for decision making, monitoring, evaluation, ethical decision making type of situations. That is where I think things are going. Um, let me go to the next. No. Okay, good. The, the fifth thing that I think is going to happen is that there's a need, the need for deep knowledge of technology uh, will be required, especially in the area of uh, security and data protection. Uh, remember that accounting is the language of business. So we, uh, if you're an accountant, you, you basically fit into the entire stream of the business. Now, before uh, electronic technology came into being, there were people who were still stealing information from businesses. Now it's even much easier. They used to be, they used to send cleaners to pick up uh, documents from trash cans and all of that. These days it's very easy. Somebody sends you an email, you open it, it takes over your computer and extract all the information out there. So uh, even as an accounting professional, the idea of security and data protection is something that we are going to have to even take more seriously. And we have to think about that as we are designing courses and training. Uh, I expect universities to incorporate more technology education in the accounting program, as I mentioned. I mentioned ACCA and AICPA when I was talking earlier. Um, some of the virtualizations and the grading policies that we enacted during the COVID, I expect them to stay. Uh, if somebody could get a pass or fail in a particular course during the COVID, why can't they get it next year? If it used to be A, B, C, and now we're doing pass or fail, I expect that some of these things will be staying. And then I think that um, as I, one of my friends in Malaysia was saying that come to find out actually I like working from home and I, I want this to be permanent. And I think that a lot of people are going to be asking for this type of thing. And I think, I think employers are going to uh, continue to uh, offer this type of um, accommodation to their employees. Matter of fact, I have a friend in Atlanta whose company decided that um, all the employees should work from home permanently because guess what? They are going to cancel their lease uh, and save $100,000 a month from paying the lease. If your employees can work from home and you can get the same quality type of treatment uh, reporting, then why pay $100,000? Just let them work from home. And that is what some of the companies have already decided. So what we used to say at Case Western Reserve is, you've said all of this, so what? Why is this, why, why, so what? And what I think is that as education people, we need to design our accounting courses to enable our, our graduates to take advantage of these skills that employers are going to need. Because whether we like it or not, accountants cannot be eliminated from business, but we have to make them effective once they get into the business arena. And I think that, is, that should guide the way we design our courses going forward. Any questions? I hope that um, I didn't abuse my time here, Doc. No, you did not abuse your time. Thank you very much for this. I, I, I missed the opportunity to, to do accounting and be an accountant, but you just made it so lovely. You made it look very, very simple, but I didn't find it very simple when I was a student. The reason why I ran away. <laughs> Yeah, the, so, so, so this has been extremely illuminating. I think that there are questions that some people have already posted some questions here, but we are going to take questions uh, for you. I, I, have, um, I have taken a number of lessons, not even for accounting purposes, but for running the business school. Uh, for example, we are struggling to put up a multi-million complex uh, facility uh, to expand our uh, our reach in terms of uh, being able to expand and, and have new programs. And your presentation just uh, sparked a thought in my head. Why should I put up such a huge building if it is possible to get our students to take their lectures from their offices in the evening like we are doing um, and, and to make sure that they get a, a, a stress-free uh, learning environment rather than drive all the way in traffic into the business school and, and, and then and start quarreling with their faculty because they came in late and stuff like that. So, so these are very 
very, very powerful uh, invocations that we will need to uh, look at. But let me see what uh, Ivan, Ivan has a question. He, he says, hi, Professor, it's great to hear your voice again. With respect to auditing, do you think it's wise to release financial statement prepared through remote audit? Or you think the face-to-face -face interaction is key to identify potential areas of weakness or fraud? And how that might affect publicly traded businesses when their queues need to be filed? Do you anticipate shareholder skepticism uh, negatively affecting share prices? So that's a, a mouthful question, but I think this is a very important question. Uh, even when you auditors come and see us physically, we are we are sort of worried that you wrote things that we didn't really or you didn't really find out. What, what, what's your view about remote auditing? Well, um, thank you very much, Evan. So this is a very very important issue that Evan has raised. Um, the we call auditors independent auditors, but the more you look at audit reports and the role of auditors, they are not necessarily independent. They are oftentimes the joint issuers of financial statements because somebody does the work and then you come to say, yes, the work is good. It means technically you have contributed to it. Now, here's the issue. If you're saying the work is good, but you can't substantiate or you can't verify the uh, underlying data and underlying information that led to that audit report, then how do you justify your, the response or the certification that you're giving to the audit report? Now, when you collect data from a remote location, there are so many things that can happen. One, you haven't had a chance to inspect the database itself, so you have no idea whether the database is good or not. And it's out of this database that you're preparing a financial statement. The second thing is that a lot of information uh, is pulled these days using algorithms. And if something goes wrong a little bit about the algorithm, you're gonna end up with information that doesn't really work. I'll give you a good example. On Monday, we had a stock that went more than 4,000% on the US stock exchange. And then the next day, it crashed more than 4,000%. The reason why it went up that way on Monday was because some of the hedge funds algorithms basically falsely triggered that a stock was a good buy. So everybody started going in. And by the next day, the new information came out that this wasn't good and everything started crashing. And it crashed so badly. And this is just re relying on algorithms. However, we can't do without a technology in accounting. So uh, I think it was yesterday at the ACCA um, Global Audit Forum, we had this very conversation. We have to understand the need to use technology, but it's, the, the key is perceiving the technology the way it should be. Unfortunately, because most of us don't understand technology, we tend to be technology worshipers, i.e. Uh, you see that the accounting information system give you $20,000, for a particular situation and you accept it because that's what the system gave you. But if you have the proper training, then you should be able to ask yourself, is this 20,000 the system giving me the correct one? If it's not, then what should have been the correct amount? This is using the system to work for you, okay? So what we said in our discussion, we're talking about going concern and also um, audit, audit uh, evidence sufficiency. We have to use the technology, but we need to have safeguards around the use of technology, i.e. if technology delivers information to us, we still need to have certain uh, criteria that we check to make sure that this is delivering the, what we need. At the end of the day, Prof, accounting is a process, okay? And it's a process that can be automated. And so the portions that can be automated, that is where we are automating. But the fact that we've automated a portion of this process doesn't mean the system or the automation takes over the responsibility of the accountant to uh, collect, analyze, and interpret the information the way it should be interpreted. So yes, I think everyone is asking if uh, people can trust it. Um, if there's necessary safeguards around it, then yes, it can be uh, trusted. However, I'm always going to reserve, reserve judgment for 
uh, technology that has not been well vetted. I think technology has to be vetted. We shouldn't forget the core thing that we need to learn. We need to learn accounting. That is what we need to learn. And then understand where we can use technology and where we cannot use technology. Thank you very much. I have questions of my own, but let me see if, if there's anybody on the platform, uh, on the forum who is wanting to ask a question, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. But I just have a question. Whilst Prof will be at it, we would, we would uh, have you unmute yourself and ask. Professor, you, accounting is taught using a lot of figures and, and, and movements of calculations and, and a lot of principles that um, usually are, excuse my naivety, are better illustrated on a chalkboard and, or a marker board where the professor is explaining. We are going to move online and we are going to have the professor sit uh, far away um, in some place and has a computer screen before them uh, and students are going to, how do we do this well? Plus the technology divide. I, even here, I can see that there are a couple of students. Prof, yes. let, let, can I interrupt you a second? Yes, please, go ahead. I had, a, I had a screen freeze, so I missed quite a bit of what you were saying. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, so I don't know if you guys heard everything I was saying. <laughs> No, 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 we didn't hear anything. We didn't hear anything. We didn't? No, oh. We didn't hear anything. You didn't hear my response? I thought, I thought you had finished. You, you, got to, you, you got to a point, I think a minute or so ago, that we couldn't hear anymore. But, oh, OK. But, but you, we got a larger chunk. So when I saw the freeze, I thought you had finished your answer. I, 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 I heard. So please go ahead. Please go ahead, sir. I don't know where I left off, but what I'm saying is that your, your, your microphone, I don't know who you are, but it looks like I couldn't hear you anymore. Uh, oh. Ah, yeah, I can hear you now. Hello? Okay, good. So the, 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 the final thing that I was saying is that so long as we put the necessary safeguards in place, yeah. we should be able to trust information that we get from our, uh, technology, gathered information. Yes. Right. And, but how about the issue about the stakeholder skepticism and, and, and share prices? And you just told us a story about how uh, the stock market, one stock, you know, went up by 4,000% and crashed the next day, uh, minus 4,000%. Uh, you, you, do you think that shareholders are going to be, to be trusting the, the data, the information that you come up with um, when they go for their board meetings, I guess also virtual board meetings and stuff like that. Well, the, yes, to, to a large extent. Um, the, is, this, is, this is the best version of the truth that we can find. Okay. You know, um, it, it's audited reports the best version of the truth that we can find. Um, You're not going to have a foolproof uh, type of reporting. Uh, if you take a company, and I'll, I'll drop a name, if you take a company like General Electric, mm. they have a headquarters in Boston, but they have operations in almost every country. So one question that uh, myself and Professor Simpson and those of us who teach accounting have to ask is, when our graduates come out of our institutions and they look at the sales of a company like General Electric, can that accountant, whether you are a CFO or whatever it is, can you comfortably say that a $10 transaction that occurred in Upper West Region in Ghana, that flows into this um, $10 billion that they're reporting as revenue, can you actually trace it? Or can you confidently say that this $10, uh, $10 or whatever it is, actually flow into this $10 billion sale. If you don't know how, or if you can't confidently say yes, you probably are not trained well. And, and, and that is the type of um, graduates that we need to think about producing. Because the, the world is going to get even more complex than the way it is right now. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I definitely uh, agree with you that the world is going to get more complex. Uh, we're subjecting ourselves to the dictates of, and I agree with you, uh, 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 artificial intelligence and all of those uh, God rhythms. And, and uh, yes, anybody else has a question to ask? Uh, thank you, Dr. Kwame Asamwa, my head of department, for joining uh, the session. Um, the, the, the accounting students who are here, do you want to ask any questions to your professor? This is free consultancy. Uh, you would struggle to find them uh, in the upper terraces of conferences. But now, Jesse, you want to ask a question? And tell yes. me. Yes, Jesse, go ahead. Yes, um, I think my question is in relation to um, what you were also asking earlier on. Yeah. That accounting um, usually has to do with face-to-face, -face, using the board, and, and, and all those. So how is, is that going to relate as well, as far as how to use the board in terms of figures and, and all those stuff as, as, as well? Right. So I was asking that earlier, Professor. I, my accounting, at least from my village secondary school, was on the board, and you draw lines, and you, you add figures, and, and then now you have complicated issues, and even complicating it more, and saying that we should go online and teach accounting. Uh, how do we do it? Plus, the, the digital divide of some of our students are actually on their mobile phones um, and, and, and they are expected to be able to. How do you, you know, wrap your, heart, your mind around all of these uh, whilst we're moving online and doing a lot more work online? Um, so I was going to do a little demonstration, but there's no time. Um, the, I think the biggest, the, the problem is actually more of the digital divide than the technology because technology is there. Yeah. So technology is there to organize, to help us, uh, do this, uh, the, 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 the board, the board analysis thing. Uh, if you can see my, if you can see my, my, my screen, right. can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. If you can see my screen, I have a digital camera here. Okay. Yes, I can see that. Okay, so I have a digital camera. This is a piece of paper. Yeah, I can and see. This is where I'm sitting is actually my classroom. Okay. Okay. So let's say uh, uh, Professor Baole uh, puts uh, 1,000 CDs in his bank account. I'll yeah. see your bank. Okay. I would debit your, your bank account by 1,000 CDs. Yeah. And then I'll credit. Let's say this came from our, our credit. Uh, whether if it's sales, I put one thousand CDs. So the same thing that you were looking on the board. Mm. Okay, you can see me do it here. Right. And right. matter of fact, this is what I'm going to use with with my University of Ghana students on Monday. Ah. So uh, instead of having the board, this is what I'm going to be doing. The problem is the digital divide, as you mentioned. Right. If you don't have access to the internet then this is not going to work. Right, right. Yeah, so the technology is there to mimic the classroom, the blackboard and things like that. The issue is whether you can actually access it or not. Mm. So I'm using, I'm using a doc cam. Teddy has one of these. Yes, Teddy, uh, you're, you're, okay, so you just made life easier for me. I, I learned right. one, uh, I think it's really exciting. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Teddy, your hand is up. Do you want to go and ask your question now? Uh, thank you, Prof. And thank you um, for your presentation to end the opportunity. Um, there are opposing views from students and management from higher education regarding um, refunds of tuition fees, um, accommodation fees, etc. Um, from the accounting point of view, uh, or from accounting uh, perspective, what is your take on um, refunds on fees and accommodation and other stuff amid um, COVID-19 interruptions? And if that happens, how do you think management or higher education should account for such um, refunds uh, in the um, school or university? Wow, this is this is more of a political question than accounting question, though. But yes, it, 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 it depends. It depends on the type of school and the leverage you have. 
in America especially, we have private schools and then we have state-assisted schools. The private schools pay more, uh, the state-assisted schools don't pay as much. So, but even with that, uh, I haven't heard anybody talk about giving refunds for um, academic school fees. So most of our school fees will have academic components and also have uh, boarding components. You can't charge somebody boarding fees when the person is studying from home. Uh, so when it comes to the academic part, I doubt that anybody is going to compromise. Remember that uh, these schools, again, these schools have buildings, they have all sorts of things that they have to pay for, whether somebody's on campus or not. So I, I don't see the school fees changing. However, there is an existential problem here for especially private schools because, again, I just mentioned if I can get the same course on Coursera for, let's say, $500 or even $1,000, why should I pay you $5,000 to teach me the same thing I can get from Coursera? So schools, especially in the private sector, are going to have to reanalyze their value proposition. Uh, it, goes, that it goes way beyond refunds. Uh, there's a big shape, shake up coming. That's the way I see it because um, COVID has taught all of us a lot of things. It's it, it shown us things that we didn't think we could do. You know, I didn't think, I, I was always worried about, especially my principles of accounting students. I thought, hey, if this person is not in front of me, this person is not going to do well. But what I found was that working for the students actually enjoyed being at home. One of my students, I now drop his name, Saba. Saba logs in and what I do with my students is that when we come online like this, you have to show your face because I need to see and know that you're doing well. So Saba gets on the phone, he's laying in bed. And I said, hey, oh, you're still in bed? You don't want to say, professor, yeah, I don't want to miss the class, but I don't want to, um, I, I, I feel like I want to stay in bed. And so, Prof, I thought that, oh, he was just going to log in and just watch me deliver the class. And this guy was actually asking questions and he was laying in bed. He was laying in bed, asking questions, actively participating in my class. This is not something you think about, but now he's found out that he can do it in an accounting class. So how do you tell this person to come to a brick and mortar school and come and pay you hundreds, uh, thousands of dollars for something that he can actually lay in his bed and get. So there's a shakeup coming. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the refund part, but I think that uh, private schools, especially, are going to have to rethink their pricing to, to, in order to stay in business. Yeah, the, the, and I agree with you. It's a more political question. Um, we, we are not giving refunds. So the students who are here, sorry, we aren't giving refunds. Um, quality hasn't decreased. In, in fact, from uh, Prof's uh, presentation, it looks like value has just shot up. So we should actually be charging you more. Really. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> value has gone up because you can, you can relax at home. You, you would avoid all the stress of coming on campus and not somebody comes to give you a finger and all of that. So you, you, you are fine. You are fine. So we will keep charging what we are charging. Uh, uh, but um, this, uh, Benjamin is giving us a lot of information. Benjamin says, yes, there are other um, uh, systems you can use. Microsoft Office has, the Microsoft 360 has uh, functionalities for you to share your, your whiteboard and, and stuff like that. Uh, Zoom has a, a whiteboard function and, and uh, many of these are, are being used. Um, uh, so, so there are, there are um, uh, the universities, are, people are learning everything every day. I mean, even for people who have difficulties with computers, they, now they are, doing it yes any, any more questions before we let uh prof rest and then we introduce the next speaker this has been exciting for me um yeah okay so prof hello uh, okay isaac go ahead. I, yeah isaac want to uh, uh, i want to uh, suggest something in the <laughs> curriculum the accounting curriculum for another they should introduce a program like account tech, accounting technology in order to support students who will be grown uh, uh, into in, in that profession. Mm. 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 Accounting te technology and software resources as part of our program to develop as before we graduate from And again, uh, I teach in this. Yes, Hello. 
Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'm a teacher in a secondary school, teaching accounting and costing. Um, it is realized that for now, the enrollment into business program is entirely going down from the secondary school. Others will go to a program like uh, general art. Afterwards, when they get to the universities, they want to pursue accounting. So you realize that they don't have the budget. What are we doing as a business school to rectify that from the uh, onset? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will allow the professor to give us some perspectives on the two questions. Um, I, I, I didn't hear part of the question well. said, what are we doing to what? So, um, if you go to the enrollment from, yeah, from the business school and from the secondary. You know, in Ghana, you can do business in the secondary school. And he says that the, that the number of students opting to do uh, business in secondary school is reducing drastically. And he thinks that would affect uh, the basis that the university student has before they come into the program uh, in the university. And his question is, what do we do? Well, it, it, it's it's it, it's um, it's it's a matter it's a matter of value. It's a matter of value. Uh, what are people seeing as uh, the best money maker in Ghana right now? That's basically what is driving what people uh, want to do. Uh, I remember when I was in secondary school, um, I did accounting at all levels, um, and I did accounting because at the time. Uh, you either have to be a doctor, a lawyer, or you have to be an accountant to see any significant income. So that was what was driving me. Uh, when it was time for me to go to SysForm, uh, I had courses I wanted to do, but my father also agreed. And when I went, the courses had already been selected for me. So it comes down to value. And what we need to do is we need to uh, sell accounting or even business education to the young people, let them understand what they will be able to get out of business education. Without that, you can't get people to commit. Everybody's looking at, okay, how can I be? People are, I'm sure a lot of these guys that he's talking about are trying to go to, uh, they want to be the next, the next Bill Gates or they want to be the next, uh, uh, what's the name, Zuckerberg or something. So a lot of people are probably going towards IT, which is not a bad thing. Um, but we have, to, we, ha we have to be able to uh, explain the value proposition of accounting education to the young ones in order to attract them. You can't force them. And that's the question that uh, Idrisu has just put up. He says, uh, um, you know our colleague Idrisu, uh, he, two weeks ago he was here talking, and for last week I think. Uh, can you please provide some thoughts in relation to the way forward in accounting education post COVID-19? and decreasing the traction for accounting education. Uh, he says jumping out. So it looks like there's decreasing traction for accounting education. I, I don't, I don't um, fully understand the question. Um, there, there is, well, uh, I, I don't know if, I, I wouldn't say that in, in my area or in my arena, um, if anything at all, there, there are people in sciences who are coming to business schools to do business education. Uh, because uh, a lot of them have uh, hopes and aspirations of setting up their own businesses. And so we see more of that. Uh, in terms of my school and other programs that I've seen, uh, people are flocking towards accounting. Um, I haven't seen a very poor accountant. I haven't seen a rich one, but I haven't seen a poor one either. So the value proposition is quite known. The demand is there um, when you come to, at least for my program, um, we have a hundred percent placement for our graduates, and so we use that. Uh, we leverage that when we're recruiting, and we have a lot of people that are coming in. So, I I haven't seen that, but I do I do agree that we need to improve the quality of our graduates. That I I, I agree. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ba. I think that uh, you have given us our money's worth and more. Uh, this evening, and I want to say a big thank you to you uh, for making time to speak to us this evening. Um, stick by, maybe there will be people who would get uh, further thoughts uh, and ask you questions, um, and so we can move on to the next presenter.
but we are extremely grateful. The next presenter is our own head of department for the Department of Accounting, um, Dr. Nanayao Simpson, um, SNY Simpson, is the senior lecturer and the head of accounting. Uh, here in the, uh, the business school. He holds a PhD in accounting and finance from the University of Birmingham in the UK. Uh, his teaching and research and consulting interests include uh, areas in financial, uh, public financial management, sustainability reporting and assurance, corporate governance and accounting education. Uh, there is one thing that he didn't add. Myself and him have a common interest in non-profit accounting. So, um, this is, um, you didn't add that to your profiles. Please do that. He has over six years of consulting. He has over 10 years of consulting and has consulted and trained for a wide range of clients, including the World Bank, the German Development Corporation, uh, the International Finance Corporation, the Interministerial Coordinating Committee on Decentralization, uh, and several other areas, including the Ghana Oil and Gas Inclusive Group. The, the, he is currently the chair of the, um, the University of Ghana Credit Union. So, so he's doing a lot of corporate uh, social responsibility work, and he's done work for the uh, Association of the Credit Union Association of Ghana, the Micro Institution Network. He's done work for the National Communications Authority, and many more. Uh, Dr. Simpson is um, a lover of students and a supporter of students. Again, that's one of the areas we share common interest. Uh, this evening, he is going to be talking to us on the, um, one minute for me, please. Um, he is to be talking to us on, he's talking to us on the test COVID-19, a test on an opportunity for adopting ESG. Huh. Uh, Nana, I can't read your, the, um, so. I've I'll, shared my slides. Yes, the slide is here, Good, great. So COVID-19, a test or an opportunity for adopting ESG practices. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what ESG means, um, but Nana will take us through in the next 30 minutes or so, um, and please stick by, please inform those who are here to join that we are here, and we are having a very lovely evening of accounting education uh, from Accounting Educationist. Thank you very much, Nana. All right, thank you, uh, Dean Bowley, um, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm excited. I've seen a number of my students uh, because we are supposed to have a class this evening. And this is certainly useful for our discussion we have in as far as corporate sustainability is concerned. Uh, by way of uh, outline, I'm just going to uh, talk about uh, the COVID-19 regards to its effects. Uh, talk about the uh, ESG practices, what are the elements, the motivations, and perhaps uh, what are some of the areas that I would say that um, COVID-19 is either testing or perhaps providing opportunity uh, for businesses to explore ESG. Uh, I will certainly conclude with some reflections, certain things that uh, I believe we may uh, need to look at. Uh, I'll be quick to say that uh, this particular issue that I'm looking at, it's, it's, it's something I'm, I'm exploring. Um, because if you look at the country, Ghana, uh, a few companies uh, actually uh, adopted, have adopted ESG, they are engaging in ESG activities. And, and therefore, I believe that I mean, post this particular uh, presentation, uh, I could get onto the field and I get a lot, uh, get more, a lot more information. Uh, what has been a discussion so far? Uh, well, we've been looking at the effect of COVID-19, uh, the direct and the indirect effect. Uh, direct in terms of it affecting uh, countries, affecting companies, uh, indirectly affecting uh, individuals and and our family members. 
Uh, we could also look at the discussion along um, the smallest units, you know, what a scientist will call the, the, the atom. Uh, so from individual level, families, um, uh, organizations, uh, countries, uh, continents, and, and the world at large. That has also been uh, part of the conversation that we've had so far. Uh, we also looked at how it's affecting uh, these areas that I spoke about by way of economically, how it's also affecting socially, and, and, and finally, environmentally. It's actually instructive to note that uh, it appears the discussion has been uh, biased towards the negative you know, implication. And even with the positives, uh, if you take the businesses, the, the telcos, where everyone is using data here or there, uh, some of us think that even though it is positive, uh, it is just a default position, not that they were really extraordinary in terms of maybe strategy or another, other things, but it's more of a default uh, kind of stuff. So uh, looking at the negative and positive implication, uh, there's been some, some work where we perhaps look at how COVID is affecting the environment. And as you can see from uh, this uh, uh, simple illustration, we clearly say that yes, because of COVID, we've been asked to stay at home. Uh, yes, staying at home means that we're going to consume a lot more. There will be waste. So while there's waste, that will certainly have some negative, you know, implication on the uh, environment. And we can also look at it from the positive side. We are staying at home, so there are less vehicles in the system. And what happens is that people are also not going to the, the factory manufacturing the setting. So what happens is that, I mean, the air that we breathe in, it's, it's a bit more... Uh, pleasant, a bit more healthy. So we can look at, you know, uh, 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 the COVID discussion along this line. So talking about bit about the environment leads me to uh, the conversation about uh, ESG. Uh, ESG covers the environmental issues as far as businesses, organizations are concerned, even countries are concerned. Uh, it also includes the social elements as well as the governance issues. I must say that conversation about environment, the social and the governance, so far as business are concerned, is actually not a new thing. Uh, but I must say that the, the, the convention has been in, actually, in silos. So you see environmental issues being discussed, social issues being discussed, and governance issues being uh, uh, talked about. But the issue about ESG practice advocates the need to integrate this particular element, trying to make sure you get an optimal mix of each of this. And it's actually um, one researcher somewhere 2005 who uh, kind of made this uh, integration of social and uh, treatment of environmental, social, and governance issue a bit more prominent. Uh, like I said, uh, in, in countries like Ghana and elsewhere, we do talk about social responsibility, corporate social responsibility. It is not new to us. Sustainable development meeting our present needs without compromising our ability of future generation. Socially responsible investment, sustainability report, integrated reporting. So the point is that all these things are being discussed. But whatever we talk about ESG, it certainly has some relation, you know, with these elements. But I want to look at ESG within the context of value addition and not just a mere donation, uh, looking, at, uh, 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 looking at ESG as a one-stop shop or one other thing, but looking at it in terms of how ESG is part of the accounting practice, how that is part of your value chain, how that is part of your business processes before it gets to your final consumer. Uh, I must say that ERG uh, has the potential of uh, instigating organizations to redefine their purpose, define their purpose of existence, and that also do, uh, does have the opportunity in terms of improving the quality of management of such organizations. Uh, ERG, unlike, let's say, the other ones, 
focuses on measurement of, of those three things that I spoke about, uh, the activities associated with environment, activities associated with the social base, as well as the governance issue, so that we are going to get objective matrices, uh, rather than just we having, you know, rhetoric uh, 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 reports. Uh, but we want to make sure that whenever we are assessing a firm performance, the performance will not be biased towards, let's say, financial or economic, but we assess performance along social, environmental as well. So when we talk about the environmental issues, then we should be, be concerned about the climate change conversations, you know, the carbon emissions as, as, as businesses. Uh, how we manage uh, the natural resources at our disposal, uh, things about energy consumption, things about, you know, water uh, usage, you know, and, and other related issues. In accounting, we talk about uh, depletion of assets, but what we usually hear more has to do with depreciation, but perhaps as we talk about ESG, we'll go beyond the depreciation of the tangible asset, but we'll get into some of these natural resources as well. Under the social element, we are looking at uh, how companies are managing relationship so far as the employees are concerned, so far as the opportunity, uh, so far as the community within which they operate are also uh, concerned. The well-being, welfare, health and safety, you know, of their uh, uh, employees. And I once uh, asked, uh, I posed this question to my, my student. I said that well, as an accountant, when you see the medical bills of, of, of uh, 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 the company going up, what will be the possible thing that you do? And certainly the response was that, well, maybe what I'm going to do, I'm straight, going straight away going to advise, look, let's give every employee some ceiling, how much you know you can, you can spend for us your uh, health or medical bills are concerned. But ESG is supposed to push accountants to think beyond that and to perhaps uh, have engagement with HR. Let's get to know, investigate, interrogate the issue. Why are we spending so much on employees? Maybe, maybe they are not getting their, their, their uh, vacation or their, their leave as and when you know, it's expected. It could be that maybe the lighting system, maybe the kind of chairs that they are sitting on and so on and so forth. You know, so, so, so the social element is something that when we begin thinking about and we start engaging, it is actually going to save a lot more, which will certainly affect, you know, one of our bottom lines. We certainly also want to look at, you know, our implication, activities, organizing the implication on the community at large. Whenever organizations are engaging community within the context of the social element, who do they talk to? Perhaps opinion leaders, would you say the things that they are talking about are things of interest to uh, everyone? Does it, does it, does it, does it represent uh, the interest of everyone? Maybe that is one of the things that, that parents may want to look at. Then the governance bid, leadership of the organization, the, 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 the shareholder right, the, the board diversity issues, the regulatory and the compliance issues. Most importantly, even the internal control. Uh, we, do, uh, we, we tend to see, whenever we talk of internal audit, we tend to see the emphasis on, on accountants performing that internal audit function. But once we start talking about ESG, we are concerned, we are talking about accountants going beyond the economic aspect, be interested in the social environmental issues and how uh, we can have controls in place to make sure that uh, we capture and we report uh, all the social, environmental, as well as the traditional economic issues that we do cover. The reason is that why should firm or why would organizations be undertaking environmental, social, governance related issues? Uh, there are several reasons uh, that have been postulated by scholars. And there are also empirical evidence supporting some of these arguments. Uh, one of them is that yes, firms may be undertaking ESG because they want to be able to align the activities you know, uh, to the norms and values of society. And certainly, if you realize, uh, if you consider the element of interest to 
the society, the community, certainly it's not only the economic aspect, it's not only their profit, but they are also interested in the social and environmental implication. And therefore, firms want to undertake ESG, so they will obtain some form of legitimacy within the eyes of the society. And uh, certainly they want to build and protect, you know, the trust that the community may give that other stakeholders, you know, they want to repose in them. And uh, there are also conversations about, you know, stakeholder power. Uh, from our accounting, when I talk about group account, they are conversing about control and significant influence. So the element is that if your shareholders, those who have controlling interest, controlling power, are interested in environmental and social issues, then certainly that will be an issue that one wants to pursue. And I must, I must say that uh, investors are getting interested in ESG. And that can 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 uh, uh, bring in a lot more funds, a lot more investment into your organization. You could also talk about the asmovism, you know, element uh, where you see the coercive bits coming from from regulation. Um, uh, in countries like like South Africa, I'm, I'm referring to uh, the continent, South Africa, and even beyond South Africa, other parts of the world where ESG issues are more of a listing requirement. Uh, ESG issues, uh, regulatory issues, firms are being forced to do that. I can't say the same for, 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 for Ghana. Um, we could also say that the pressure could also come from the mimetic elements, the fact that there are successful businesses across the globe. Uh, and what is happening is that they are not taking some of these things in their supply chain, their value chain, in their engagement and other related issue, and they are successful and they are making a lot of strides. So, firms may want to imitate. And that we could also look at it from the normative bits. Um, that is where, by virtue of a firm's association or deciding to be part of a group, and there are certain norms and values that they are expected to espouse. For instance, there's, there's, there's a group. Um, that are registered under the UN Global Compact. So whenever you register under UN Global Compact, you are expected you know, to report and disclose and to have system structures capturing things uh, on environmental, social, and related uh, issues. Having said all of this, we ask ourselves, what are some of the areas that you know, we can test as to whether we are pursuing ESG properly or not, and perhaps an opportunity to re-examine and look at certain areas. And one main area could be our value chain as, as, as a business, you know, or as an organization. Uh, looking at your primary, you know, activities and looking at your support, you know, activities the inbound, outbound, and other related issues, where can you see the environmental and the social elements? I'll be quick to say that whenever we look at both these uh, primary and uh, 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 support activities, our conversation tends to be biased towards the economic aspects. But it's high time that as uh, COVID is exposing, uh, 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 or it's bringing out some of these things, we need to find out when we take our primary activities, and ask what activities, to what extent are we pursuing or to what extent do we have this ESG element, you know, imbibed. Supply chain, yes, related to value chain, but this we are looking more at the, the inflow and outflow of goods and services and other related issues. And in fact, with this, I must say that for, I mean, some of the multinationals, they are really considering the supply chain element seriously when it comes to ESG. The fact that wherever they get their goods, their raw materials from, they want to make sure that you know, all the protocols are observed, all the social elements are observed. They want to make sure that the items that they get are not produced from, let's say, farms that you have char labor. They are not produced from, from, from places that uh, uh, people are underage, people are working on poor uh, conditions. So, so once these things uh, uh, are absent, or the, I mean, these uh, uh, social or environmental vices are present, 
you are not certainly going to consume, take your, 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 your product. Workforce is also another, another issue. Uh, labor uh, issues, uh, I'm excited when Prof. Baum was also talking about, he spoke about, yes, um, what is happening is that some organizations are interested uh, uh, with some people working at home. Uh, in our case, what is happening, I'm sure that others are also uh, asking people to proceed on leave, uh, not to come back, uh, others are losing their jobs. But I believe that if we have captured some of these things within, I mean, the context of the social implication, how this is going to affect, you know, employees, uh, how we can protect them, how we can communicate some of these things to them, uh, how we can, there can also be some cost saving in there. Uh, certainly, it is something that, you know, could be explored uh, further. Crisis management, uh, you visit organizations, they have uh, crisis management policies and strategies. COVID is exposing as to whether, how realistic they are, whether we are using those as scratching the surface as to what we are putting those policies there to, 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 to fulfill our righteousness. Or perhaps it is high time uh, we look at some of these you know, uh, policies and make sure it is as comprehensive as possible to capture uh, pandemic cases like uh, COVID. The accounting and finance uh, uh, profession, the accounting and finance uh, uh, process is also affected. And I will not talk too much about that uh, because uh, Prof. Ban spoke more about the, uh, uh, the education and settling practice. Uh, but I must say, like he spoke about, there's, there's a bit of the auditing in there, there's a bit of the control in there, there are bits of, of uh, whether um, uh, you should borrow, whether you should invest, and what kind of investment should you get into, uh, whether you should save, and liquidity-related issues. Uh, how much cash should you uh, should be in, in hand, and, and, and what will be the other implication. Certainly, there are tax issues as well as regulatory concerns. Um, uh, you must know that you certainly are aware in the Ghana context that once the COVID came up, uh, there are conversations, you know, what are some of the reliefs, what are some of the stimulants, the, the tax, you know, uh, stimulants that we can put in to be able to support uh, businesses. Uh, there are things that, you know, we could also look at and perhaps there are opportunities for organizations to look at some of these things and see how we can manage our tax uh, activities, manage our, uh, our processes such that there can be some tax uh, savings. And most importantly, the overall strategy of an organization. Uh, when we are preparing our, our strategies, yes, we do the internal scanning, we do the external uh, scanning, and when we are doing the external scanning and we are looking at the pastel, the social and environmental aspect, what are the kind of things that uh, informs our discussion. Are we talking about the environment as in the only the macroeconomic, you know, uh, related issues? Uh, COVID is saying that perhaps the conversation should not just be macroeconomic issue, but we need to take into account uh, elements uh, 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 like this and how these things tend to affect the kind of uh, strategies we we'll, we'll put in place and how they are cascaded through the entire organization through the the functional elements uh, to the individual employees. So before I, I, I uh, end my, my session, then uh, there are a few things that, that, that I think we need to reflect on uh, as companies, as countries, and organizations. Uh, for me, uh, with what is happening, uh, it is high time that regulatory bodies and perhaps uh, quasar regulatory bodies, you know, find ways of responding to ESG conversations. Um, as I indicated, the countries that are, let me say, leading the path within a conversation of ESG, it is because ESG tend to be mandatory in those countries. And what is happening is that the Security Exchange Commission, the Bank of Ghana, the Minerals Commission, and other related issues need to talk about ESG. 
of course, EPA may be talking about, about it, but we need to go beyond the environmentally sensitive organizations. Uh, so they might, be, they might be talking about ESG. Uh, there was this particular study that I looked at where they were ranking, they were ranking organizations um, uh, across, I think, about 143 countries. Uh, Ghana was part, uh, and interestingly, the country I and mean, the companies in Ghana that are undertaking ESG are the multinationals. And when you engage them, they are undertaking them because they are subsidiaries of, you know, the parent companies. In the parent companies where they find themselves, ESGs are mandatory, and therefore they are comply. They are they are obliged to do that. So if you take a country like Ghana, where this is not mandatory, uh, what will happen is that they end up capturing the things that will be of interest for those uh, environments are concerned, and the things that are unique to our context may not be considered. And it's, for me, I think it's an opportunity for us to look at uh, this. Uh, I know um, Registrar General, for instance, is, is talking about how their, their, their laws can be refined so their companies can organize AGM virtually because of some of this uh, COVID, uh, COVID is concerned. So uh, COVID is certainly uh, giving us, uh, as by way of regula regulators, uh, to think uh, about ESG. Uh, the accounting and finance profession, uh, by training, by training, we are supposed to capture everything as far as the organization is concerned. So it is high time we begin developing ourselves, perhaps redirecting our skill sets so that we begin capturing ESG related issues. You know, how do we measure, how do we recognize environmental and social related issues? Uh, how do you report them? Should we just disclose them or we need to report? Certainly there are some standards, there are some guidelines that we can learn from uh, guidelines like the Global Reporting you know, Initiative, uh, guidelines like the ISO 26000, uh, guidelines uh, like, like, like Accountability 1000, uh, and, and many other things, which as accountants and, 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 and finance people, we can start exposing ourselves and, 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 and contributing our quota. Assurance, you know, is also another thing. And, and from a recent paper that my, 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 my colleague and I uh, looked at, we got to know that regulators can play some form of assurance. But if regulators are not best, they are not knowledgeable in ERG related issues, then what kind of assurance are they uh, providing? Uh, we could also broaden the, 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 the scope of work of internal auditor because the Institute of Internal Auditors require that internal auditing profession should not be the preserve of accountants. This is where we need to expand the internal audit uh, 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 profession and, and include people, a lot more people in sociology, people in HR, engineer, engineering, come together, partner, uh, accountants so that will be able to provide a lot more certification, assurance, and reliability for us, information uh, concern. We can also bring in conversations like the stakeholder panel, where uh, the argument is that look, whatever reports we produce, the ultimate beneficiary are the stakeholders. So, where how about we getting some stakeholders in place for them to express their opinion? The question is that. How can stakeholders do this? They can only do that if they understand some of these ESG related issues. We can talk about costing and pricing our products. Uh, from our management and accounting, you certainly will realize that, yes, when typically we are pricing our products, we want to look at the direct material and the direct labor. We look at the manufacturing you know, overhead, the element that we need to absorb, get it and other related issues. But from, from all these processes, do we capture the social and environmental issues? How do we cost the social issue? How do you cost the environmental issue? It is high time we look at these things and that 
will help in the pricing of our products and services. We have the capital budgeting element, our investment appraisal. And typically, whatever method approach we are using, our MPV, the pay budgeting, our stream of cash flow to do that. In considering the relevant costs, are the social and environmental issues you know, considered? For us to say that this project is feasible, this project needs to be accepted or otherwise. The question is that we need to consider some of these things. Then finally, for our risk management, the coastal framework and other related issue, is that comprehensive enough to consider some of these environmental issues, the climate change, the energy related issues? Is that comprehensive enough? Is that comprehensive again enough to look at the social elements? I must admit that we tend to be a bit more biased towards the quantifiable element, the financial and operational risk. But as we talk about ESG, we need to make sure the risk management framework that we adopt uh, actually comprehensive enough to optimize the ESG related issue. I conclude by saying that environmental, social, and governance issue ought to be part of our company strategy. And as you bear with me, companies are responding to their COVID differently, depending on how the our strategy captured the energy-related issue. Whether they are scratching the surface, they are getting to right or they are leading their path when it comes to ESG conversation. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready for some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. When you projected, I didn't know what ESG meant. Uh, I didn't know that you were dancing in my backyard. Uh, again, one of the areas we have common interest is on the issue of environment and sustainability. Um, and I agree with you uh, in the entirety of your presentation that what is value should go beyond the, the, the figures, just in terms of money figures, to look at what um, companies have to offer society. Perhaps maybe Africa's value is more than what we think it is, because to date, we are the world's uh, part of the world's lungs. We breathe the most uh, clean environment or air to the rest of the world. And so we have good value to share. But I have here questions that have already been uh, put here. Uh, Dr. Imana, that's an interesting conversation. ESG has been with us for a while. So can you kindly throw more light uh, concisely on uh, how COVID is influencing ESG going forward? Uh, quite a general question. He says you should do that concisely, but I guess that you have done that as part of your conversation. But you can go ahead and tell us how you think ESG is influencing, uh, COVID-19 is influencing ESG going forward. Oliver says, as we struggle to find, to bring into focus the long-term impact of post-COVID-19, what are the uncertainties that lie ahead of corporate sustainability executives and investors. So two questions for you now. First, the question from uh, Dr. Emmanuel Tete Asari. All right. So uh, I think if 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 I got if I I uh, got a question right, uh, the question is that uh, yes. how is COVID? He has been with us for a while. Mm -hmm. How is it? How is COVID-19 influencing the way uh, ESG is, is uh, influencing ESG going forward? Uh, uh, okay. How is COVID-19 affecting environment, social, and governance uh, of companies? Okay. I, I guess from, from the presentation, I, I actually made uh, that particular point uh, clear. Uh, I mean, practically, uh, once, once, uh, uh, because COVID was around now, we are paying particular attention to what, what, what happens, you know, uh, in our environment, even our workplaces. Uh, we have become a lot more environmentally conscious and more sensitive. 
Uh, certainly, we again come to the social element, the people that we work with, we want to uh, protect them, we want to, to, to support them in terms of their uh, social and psychological well-being in, in general. And, and, and I guess that uh, COVID is, is pushing uh, leaders of organization to be a lot more proactive, you know, be a lot more uh, proactive and not reactive. Uh, so, so this is not something we all anticipated. Uh, I don't think, even if we, if we, we guessed, uh, we anticipated that uh, we didn't give it that kind of leverage. But with this, certainly we want to think beyond just the short term, but the medium to long term. And we can connect that to even the earlier presentation. As universities, you know, as we, 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 we plan, uh, leadership as we, we plan by way of compliance and related issues, we are more long term. Uh, oriented than, 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 than the short term, and, and as well as being proactive. Uh, that's, that's what I can say for that. Question is from Oliver. Oliver says, as we struggle to bring COVID-19, uh, to bring into focus the long-term impact of post-COVID-19, what are the uncertainties that underlie, um, that lie ahead for corporate sustainability executives and investors? Um, yeah, the, the uncertainties are there, and I believe that's, 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 that's why we, we're having this uh, con conversation. Um, uh, for me, I believe that this is perhaps an opportunity for a lot more uh, sustainability practitioners, because conversation about ESG, uh, I must say, has actually not permeated through uh, the functional areas. Uh, we get we get to board level and we're having board level conversations and I'm not too sure uh, the number of organizations within let's say the country Ghana or even a continent that tend to discuss some of these things. Uh, I believe that the conversation has been more of the single bottom line being the problem economic issue, and 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 this is a wake up call for us to look at the triple bottom line. I mean, the environmental and the and the, and the social elements are things that. And I must also say that, look, investors are becoming more, you know, informed, more informed. Uh, we are not thinking about in people who just have their money and they just want to uh, get a shareholder maximization of their wealth. But they also want to make sure that what? They want to put their money into companies that are investing, you know, uh, responsibly. Uh, because of conversation like responsible finance, share responsible investment, people are, I mean, investing ethically. So the certainties are there, but I must say that those who need to invest, those who need to come on board are certainly demonstrating a lot more interest and it's high time, yeah. high time for businesses to prepare themselves or perhaps bridge themselves uh, for the paradigm shift. Thank you very much, Nana. I mean, those of us who participated in the lecture yesterday, uh, delivered by the Dr. Lord Mensah and uh, the governor of uh, the, the deputy governor of Bank of Ghana, uh, they talked about the issue of um, the sustainable banking principles. And the sustainable banking principles have lined in very detail how funding to companies and organizations would have to be done. Uh, with. And so, uh, as an accountant, uh, if you care about where you, your company gets its, its uh, funding from, either from uh, investors or from funding agencies or, or from even banks as loans, you would have to understand that now all of the environmental considerations would be factored into whether or not your company has the capacity to pay. And you, as an accountant, we'll definitely have to uh, begin to look at how these donor agencies structure their indicators. And many of these um, uh, disbursement linked indicators are such that you have to have done X or Y uh, and shown evidence of it to be able to receive the next tranche of your, of your funding or, and, and stuff like that. So these are very important conversations for accountants to uh, look up to. You, 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 Accountants will no longer stay only in your jacket and in your, in your cubicles and, and wait for their money to come. 
you, you have to be in the Edward says COVID-19 has affected revenues and revenue projections of businesses, and yet businesses are compelled to spend in certain unplanned areas associated with working from home and practicing social distancing at the offices. Now, how do Ghanaian businesses that normally would not consider ESG manage the current tough situation with ESG in mind? A double barrel, right? We already have escalated you know, expenditures resulting from COVID-19. We have reduced revenues uh, because businesses aren't doing well. And then you are here theorizing that we should also consider uh, ESG. How do we blend these? Hmm, beautiful question. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, I, 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 I would actually say that, I would actually say that if we were actually taking cognizance of ESG, we are actually going to do a lot more cost saving. There's going to be a lot more cost saving. That is why when I was looking at the testing area, I spoke about the value chain. Because the value chain, we are looking at the value additions, OK? The stream of your value addition from getting raw material to the final consumer. So if you look at all these activities, the interrelated activities, and the ESG, I mean, the social environmental issues are considered, there'll be a lot more cost saving. So it wouldn't be a, a, a posterior activity, as a lot, at the end of the day, by become of a, an a priori before the event takes place. So you don't just wait till you get to know that, well, my revenue is coming down, because it's that to, has to do with profit. Profits coming up comes from two main streams. You either increase your revenue or you manage your expenses, all right? And what ESG does is that ESG will help you manage your expenses so that if there are problems with your revenue, that can also uh, uh, help you so that you still be able to meet the, the needs of your stakeholders so far as profitability. Uh, is concerned. So for me, I think initially, yes, initially, it is it's daunting. It must be. It will be. It be cost involved in terms of making sure that you have the system and structures to capture all of these things. There should be CPDs for your 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 staff and other related issues. But in the long run, what is going to happen is that there will be cost saving, and it will affect the bottom line. Thank you very much, Nana. And I definitely agree uh, when you cited the example of uh, if somebody, uh, your accountant, and you see your medical bills go up, your first instinct will be to try and restrict how much you give to the people. But if the people come in every day sick, there's no way you can have work going on. And that's definitely going to affect your bottom line. So if you are looking beyond just your a single bottom line and going into the environment and asking tough questions about how we affect the environment negatively or otherwise and our contribution to keeping an environment that 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 is more sustaining to pro positive life uh, you definitely know that as a company you will be benefiting in the long term plus sources of raw material and all of that so very interesting conversation this evening uh, the last one, and then I'll make it the response very quick for me. Oh, somebody sent me something also. Okay. I would, um, uh, Teddy says, how can we ensure a single framework for proper accountability of ESG practices of firms and, what's, and what is the current situation regarding assurance of ESG reporting practices? So a double barrel question. And then that will be the last one, and we would move on to the last presenter. All right, my, 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 my quick response to that, when it comes to getting a framework, uh, there, are, there are existing frameworks. Uh, I mentioned uh, GRI, Global Reporting uh, Standard, starting from G1, G4, and now GRI Standard, which is, which is global. So it, it, it guides in uh, uh, organizing in terms of what should be okay? the element that one needs to uh, uh, capture uh, under ESG, and how should one do that? 
that can be done for small companies, that can be done for large organizations and, and, and I mean, manufacturing concern and service sector. So we have, we have some, some framework, some standard that could also, I mean, could be uh, a, a, a adopted by an organization. Uh, with regards to assurance, um, I must say that with my, my engagement, again, with some of the processing firms, I see that uh, the, 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 the job, let me say the job when it comes to ESG assurance, usually has been coming from the multinationals, okay, the multinational, the firms with external links. Uh, but the genus ones, we are not excited about that. And, 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 and uh, perhaps we need, to, we need to do a lot more advocacy. We need to do a lot more training. And, and, and uh, like Teddy said, we need to do maybe a lot more work for people to get to know the importance, the relevance of that. And, and when that happened, they will do that. And then the assurance providers would also get some work uh, to do. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what, I, what I can say about that. There's some form of assurance going on there, but that's the kind of assurance that you know, ought to be. I don't think we've gotten there yet, but it's been more of the basic form of assurance for those who are interested. And for the multinationals, it is more of a high level assurance. That is why they tend to engage the, the, the big four, the big four because they have the men and women, the resource to be able to do a thorough external, a thorough third party assurance for companies that are engaged, that are engaged in EAG practices. Thank you, thank you very much. Conversation to a close now, and then we'll move on to the, uh, to the last, um, to the last uh, presenter. Uh, but Nana, I want to say a big thank you to you uh, and to say that you have, uh, you have refreshed my evening. Um, thank you very much. And I know there are other questions, but we will pick them up uh, later on so that we can stay within our time. Uh, the last presenter, definitely not the least, is a practitioner. Mr. Hefron Abouadji is a partner uh, responsible for government and public sector industry group in PWC Ghana. Hefron is also a human capital partner for the assurance line of service of PS, uh, PWC Ghana. He holds a bachelor's of commerce degree in accounting, a master's degree in public administration, and is a fellow of Association of Charter Certified Accountants. Hefron is also a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountant Ghana and the Liberia Institute of Chartered Public Accountants. Hefron specializes in the delivery of professional audit, monitoring and evaluation, institutional capacity assessment and capacity building and financial management support services to government ministries, non-governmental organizations and donor agencies for more than 15 years. Hefron's experience in the public sector cuts across education, health education, water and sanitation, local governance, poverty reduction, agriculture within the Africa region, including uh, in Liberia, Benin, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Gambia, Senegal, Botswana, and of course, Nigeria. Hefron, would be talking to us this evening on a very exciting topic. And I like to uh, make reference to it again so that I can quote it exactly how it is. Um, so he will be talking to us about the impact of COVID-19 on public financial management. Um, let me say that this is an interesting conversation because next week around the same time, we would have the head of civil service and the American, the president of American Public Administration Association speaking to us on different aspects of this. And the head of civil service, Nana Jamina, will be talking to us about the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of public services across Ghana. And so I see um, Hebron's presentation today as a precursor already uh, to that conversation that would happen uh, next week. So Hefron, we appreciate that you're spending your evening with us. Uh, it's already very late, but we appreciate that you're spending your evening with us to share with us knowledge 
between us and our students. And I want to welcome you to make your presentation, uh, usually 30 minutes, and then we can have a Q&A. Thank you very much, Heifron, and we are all ears to listen to you. Thank you very much, um, Prof, and good evening to everyone um, on the call. I first of all want to um, thank in, um, the organizers of this uh, very important, you know, um, seminar or event, and I think I'm privileged to be part of the speakers uh, today. Let me attempt to share my screen. Um, okay. Please, can you see? There we are, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, I think as, um, you, thank you for the introduction once again. Um, yes, it's I, I, I think for me, I'll double again as the Dean of the uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants um, faculty, um, okay. charge of PFM. So, I think one of the key things that um, I did mention that some of these discussions um, and greater collaboration with academia um, is very, very important. And going forward, I think that, you know, um, we're going to make this more regular and interact with each other because we consistently uh, will have to work together um, as practitioners, um, as regulators from the Institute's perspective, and then also academia, because academia plays a very, very key role um, in the whole public financial management uh, process. So thank you uh, very much. Now, this is how I'm going to proceed. Um, it's my next slide, I hope I go, okay. Uh so you, I'm you, there. you need to project, if you can project uh, your slideshow. So okay, I've done that. Okay, best. Is it, is it better now? That's yeah, fine, except that we see your next slide, so you may distract. <laughs> but I know I see. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> um, Okay, let me just try to do this. Otherwise, it's fine. You can proceed. We will be fine. You'll be fine. Okay, let me. <laughs> Maybe try and click on the double um, three dots there. Let me do that. To... Yes. No, the three dots. Yes, that's what I did. And yes, then go to screen. Hide preview. No, hide presenter preview. Let me, okay. No, 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 it doesn't work. So, okay, there we go. It, it doesn't. Okay. I think we got it now. Yes. Yep. There we are. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, it tells you um, the interesting times we are in <laughs> uh, various tools, various mechanisms. Um, and here in PWC, we have you know, several of these ones. Um, and depending on which clients, uh, we will have to adopt whatever technology that suits it. So my opening remark is to say that clearly, yes, we are not in normal times. Um, and as the president said, these surely are not ordinary times. And he's prepared to work and get people back to life. But what he cannot, uh, I mean, what, what he cannot assure is that, yes, he can't bring people back to life, but he knows how to possibly bring the economy. Uh, so which clearly <laughs> tells all of us that, yes, 
these are really, really dangerous times. And um, to keep one going uh, requires a lot. And Honorable Ken, um, I think, he just <laughs> made that statement in his one of his, um, I would say, love letters uh, to fellow colleague finance ministers um, that, hey, what keeps him awake um, every day as this pandemic you know, was going on was how can he get this economy back to, I mean, to back on track. I unfortunately or fortunately uh, was in Liberia as you uh, probably did mention, uh, during the Ebola crisis. So um, some of the things, frankly speaking, <laughs> that are happening uh, for me are normal <laughs> because I think we faced um, quite stiffer, uh, we'll say difficulties and challenges uh, during the Ebola time. So it is tough for everybody. Interestingly, um every i would say in every crisis there are possibly opportunities and one of them is that you see monies flowing almost everywhere and all development partners and key stakeholders trying to come or step up to support countries and as you can see um the World Bank and other development you know, partners are looking at you know, close to $160 billion uh, in the next 15 months to help countries recover um, through loans and through um, other grant support. Um, DS Ghana will uh, and may have our fair share of um, 100 you know, million plus, um, which um, the focus would mainly um, center on health, education, and social protection. So there is going to be a lot of you know, money uh, or a lot of funds that um, we should be expecting flowing from all angles. And as we go on, I'll talk about some of them. And it's clear that all the PFM or all aspects of our PFM um, systems across Africa, across the world, really has been heavily impacted, right from the policy to the external audit um, arrangement. So budget formulation, you know, the execution aspect of it, accounting, and then the external audit, you know, function that goes with it has been heavily affected because PFM, you know, because maybe again I'm doing academia, you know, refers to set of laws, rules, or systems and processes that countries you know use to either mobilize allocate undertake public spending account for those funds and then audit the results in terms of you know definition and our in ghana our pfm you know law if you look at um, section 102 of the pfm act 2016 goes further to also define what really public financial management is. So as you may you know, um, see, all aspects of our um, public financial management system have been greatly impacted uh, by COVID. And why is this so? So from a policy perspective, clearly um, crisis situations surely cause for immediate response. And as a, most of you might have seen in Ghana and other parts of the world, presidents, finance ministers have never been busier than this. And like I said, if you look at Ken's uh, statement, he, 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 can, he can't, you know, um, ravel his head around all the daily things that, and decisions that have to be made from a policy perspective, and then also from, um, implementation and even going through execution. So fiscal policies, a huge impact on our revenue and you know expenditure policy direction because here we are, um, like the other speakers might have mentioned, you close your borders, businesses are not doing well, surely both your domestic and external um, 
resource mobilization effort have to ground to a halt because you are not going to obviously get these monies to come in as you have budgeted, you know, um, as you have planned. And in Ghana, as per the law, the finance minister came in November to come and present the budget. But you agree with me that all the assumptions that they put forward for the budget really have to be reversed. So the whole cycle on policy, the budget formulation, because they had to go, you know, um, repeatedly to parliament and go assess, you know, or activate the contingency, you know, funds, reallocate some um, expenditures or budgets that were, you know, earmarked for other sectors, reallocate them to health or to other priority sectors that can obviously respond to these um, um, emergencies. Then, coupled with budget execution, which seems to where now we are, and my next you know, um, discussion will sort of focus on, because of the crisis moment, you literally cannot do things in the normal way. Internal audit scrutiny and controls have to come in. How do you balance the controls versus saving lives? Because you need to procure this um, health equipment, you need to you know, pro uh, procure these supplies, and it has to go like in the next minute, in the next hour. So how do you balance these you know, competing needs with the stringent controls that, of course, have to happen? So our PFM laws, our um, PFM uh, regulations, the various policies and acts that um, uh, ministries, departments, and agencies procurement laws, et cetera, um, those that they have formulated had to, of course, you know, be looked at, be revised, be refined to make sure and to respond, I mean, to make sure that they're actually responding to the uh, pandemic. Here in Ghana, and like most other parts of the world, single sourcing is the norm. And we know the impact, we know the risks that this is associated with. So all of a sudden, uh, processes or rules that needs to be also adhered to, there has to be a balance between that and the lives that needs to, of course, uh, be saved. So that obviously takes us through um, the element around accounting and um, auditing. And that possibly may is, is where I may spend a little bit of time um, so that I can pause for questions, given the fact that um, most of you now will be preparing to go to bed. But one of the fundamental points I want to raise when it comes to public sector accounting, uh, which is something that uh, have occupied me for the past decade, um, trying to support government of Ghana and other um, international agencies to move towards is now really critical because if you are a country or you are an institution that was used to cash basis accounting, these are the receipts or these are the funds we receive and these are the payments, and there were no thoughts around, you know, Acquire accounting and making sure that you are making the necessary um, uh, disclosures in your financial statement with respect to how um, liabilities, creditors, etc., should be, of course, provided for in your financial statement. I think now you have a lot of work to do. And why am I saying that? If we take EFSAS 42, EFSAS is International Public Sector Accounting Standards. It's giving countries who are now on EFSAS guidance around what do you do with cash transfers and other benefits to individuals. We're here in Ghana, you know, um, we're looking for the underprivileged, the, for the uh, vulnerables to obviously um, send monies, distribute food here and there, but the point is, how do you translate 
what is guiding all these procedures and processes in, and in terms of accounting and recognition in your, in your respective um, uh, financial statement, how are those being dealt with? Those social interventions, you know, in some countries where they are guaranteeing minimum income, I believe the day that we get there in Ghana, we, people will be very happy to have <laughs> a guaranteed income, whether you are maybe working or not, uh, you can get some unemployment, you know, kind of benefit. But clearly, these are strict guidelines in line with international accounting standards that if you are part of, you would obviously know what to do at this time, rather than doing a cash base. Employee benefits, sick leave, people who have obviously have been, you know, uh, uh, infected, they may, as uh, my um, previous speakers um, did mention, companies, firms had to lay off some people. Maybe you have to take into account redundancy payment. And for most countries and for most institutions, these may be the first time, you know, having to consider these things. And of course, you know, um, accruing for those in their financial statement. Plan assets and liabilities for long-term benefit plans. You realize that you take a financial statement of a public uh, sector entity and you don't see these valuations, you know, done and properly accrued for in the financial statement. So with this impact, you really have to then go back. Public sector entities that have not adopted IFSAS will really have to go back to get all these valuations done and bring them to the books to be able to assess and know the exposure that they have. Provisions, um, contingent liabilities and assets. In fact, when COVID-19 hit, um, I just put a, a short note that I don't know whether it's by coincidence that if SARS-19 and COVID-19 seems to be going <laughs> together. So <laughs> you get to do your provisions <laughs> in accordance with, you know, if SARS-19 and you have COVID-19 to deal with. So clearly, if you have not been thinking through institutions that are, are legal, you know, cases and all those uncertainties, you know, ongoing, but have not reflected anywhere in the financial statement, with COVID coming, you really have to do more. If that's 28, 29, 41, we call it the financial instrument standards, Surely, like I did mention, there are a lot of interventions by development partners, you know, banks, for that matter, sovereign, you know, um, financial institutions, etc., have to come out with certain arrangements. And you either may be going for a loan, you know, either a grant or credit or any of those. All those elements actually require certain element of disclosure certain element of financial analysis, certain element of risk analysis, and which if you have or you have not adopted an accrual accounting, that already gives you this, you know, broad information to enable you take a decision, and especially at this time that, you know, this pandemic is on, it will be helpful then for you to just consider that brief impact, and then you can move on. But then you see most entities, in this case, um, struggling to be able to sort of um, get to this um, level. The impact on the financial statement as a whole, some public sector entities may, of course, if uh, in the absence of any support, may be looking at you know, uh, going consent uh, considerations. We know, for instance, that all airports shut across the world means that most of the aviation sector and industries, and for that matter, our Ministry of Tourism and all those other um, sectors will heavily be impacted. And therefore, if you're preparing financial statement in that particular sector, and like I said, 
if you are not using an accrual accountant that already presents to you a lot of information and analysis, you first of all will not even be able to know your current financial uh, statement maturity, let alone go into this. So revenue, clearly, as I mentioned, already without a very good revenue projection, where you know that you, of course, know what to match, what to bring in during the year, uh, what to possibly defer um, as per um, IFSAS 23, and all the fiscal, you know, government fiscal policies, grants, and we call it in IFSAS, you know, tax and non um, uh, tax and non tax sort of uh, revenue, tax and transfers, or any other sort of um, revenue from non exchange um, in transactions or being donor support, people's inability or countries or for that matter institutions inability to be or have or adopt accrual accounting really are going to be heavily impacted in this. Finally, on accounting, as an, I would say what we, we call recommended practice guidelines. So in, in addition to the broader FSAS 42 standards, that I just picked uh, some few highlights. You have other disclosures which center on reporting on long-term uh, financial sustainability that try to help you project and see how sustainable your entity will be based on your current you know, uh, way of business and the balance that, of course, you are uh, you have been practicing over the over the years, so it's very very important and it steps into the financial statement discussions and analysis because we will agree at this point that if you take Ministry of Health, where every country um, basically they are the most stretched um, sector as we speak, how much is for example going into um, uh, COVID-19 procurement of health uh, products versus malaria, versus HIV, versus TB. Are we able to do those analysis? And those analysis exist before where we know where our uh, funds were going and how many people were, were being rich as a result. And therefore, what kind of ratios, if you pick it from private sector perspective, the ratio analysis on current ratio, et cetera, those key programmatic you know, elements that come into um, the various financial statement discussions, as well as service performance provision in this um, sector. So broadly speaking, countries or ministries or departments or agencies that have over the years not applied a CUA accounting and I'm happy uh, to mention that the University of Ghana, which is the University of Choice, um, is, as far as I know, in Ghana, the first university to have adopted full accrual accounting, um, um, EFSAS. And I think your uh, financial statement last year was based on EFSAS. So that becomes a starting point, especially if you are in this um, COVID era, in terms of revenue that you're going to obviously uh, lose or make from students, you have a comprehensive data from a financial reporting perspective to be able to take that decision. And my fear for most entities who are not in that category is that clearly you will not be able to, you know, have the right information. And most public um, financial management, I mean, expert will find it very difficult having the right information and the right data to be able to make the right um, uh, decision at this point. That moves me to one, I'll say, uh, uh, very difficult uh, conversation around the entire transparency and accountability and link to um, how external audit function and supreme audit institutions will be performing. So clearly, there will be huge quantities of money from multiple sources, and not only money, equipments, 
and other things would of course be flowing from all angles to the country to ministries to agencies etc um we are aware here in ghana in most african countries um in west africa and beyond there are governments setting up covid 19 funds private sector setting up covid 19 funds um other you know interest groups civil society setting up certain you know funds everybody is setting up a certain kind of funds and there are pressure to spend quickly because like i'm saying people are dying and therefore you need to um take care of those people before then you think of any other thing else but in the scheme of all this is the issue about transparency and accountability of those public funds and as a public sector uh, practitioner for me this is what we are going to battle with for the next uh, i'll say years ahead during this covid era and therefore the misuse of funds lack of scrutiny of payments really are going to pose a lot of risks uh, to us and that means that we all have to play a role in the entire process of ensuring transparency and accountability at you know um, all levels and that means that supreme audit institutions should get ready i believe we, in ghana we have a popular auditor general uh, who will come after you anytime but it goes beyond that public sector auditors would and are going to face the biggest test in times like this from a human resource perspective there's going to be a lot of pressure there's going to be a lot of digital upscaling because really staff and um experts within you know the the supreme audit institutions need to be experienced so for example you would you would and they may need to have people that have uh, have for instance um supply chain procurement um i mean procurement and supply chain um experience they will need to have people who are even medical professionals because some of the reviews or some of the audits will require these specialized skills issues about technology is very key i know that most supreme audit institutions you know across africa um it's really run on manual you know system or arrangement of as far as the auditing is concerned so investment in infrastructure needs to be heavy at this point and that is going to come at a huge cost versus what most of them have not been used to in terms of remote auditing what are the infrastructure what are the technology what are the audit softwares that are available to be able to audit these institutions but don't forget it may not be their fault because some also or most public institutions do not uh, uh, have their processes not automated most of them are on manual you know uh, basis so it's very difficult to obviously link um uh, the two but clearly issues around technology is going to be critical in terms of how they handle these audits going forward and be able to where there are sophisticated transactions be able to ensure that the various systems methods and audit um, 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 approach are able to address those risks because the issue of fraud and suspicion as per isas and intosai is clearly going to be um, again you know critical and therefore auditors will need to assess they need to look at their audit approach because it is not going to be business as usual the auditor general and his team in the various countries will have to spend a lot of time to really assess the various risks and then plan a very good response that will address the issues and concerns of stakeholders in that respect that links to issues around you know going concern in terms of the report 
And therefore, if some, some entities or ministries are going to be in crisis for this uh, reason, the financial report or the auditor's report will have to show that. Changes and response in areas of inventory, et cetera, are going to obviously be critical because you're having PPEs, some use, some yet to be used, and the risks associated with it, whether you should be physically present to be able to count the remaining um, uh, stock or items, or you obviously would have to plan a different approach to be able to address that. So in conclusion, it's very critical that all the various activities within the PFM chain, we have to be, you know, agile because it is not static and things are not, of course, you know, things are changing almost every now and then. And therefore, if you have laws, rules that are static and such that stakeholders are not prepared to what change, then clearly it will be very difficult for us to respond in this um, um, effort. And I know that in many countries and even in Ghana, you know, certain provisions and, you know, um, exemptions have to be, of course, um, applied. Waivers have to be given in some areas. I remember when I was in Liberia, one of the, for some of the interventions that was being carried by uh, some of the development partners, and for that matter, some government institutions, there has to be a clear law to exempt those things from audits, for example. So you know right from day one that issues that has to, or expenditures that has to do with the ETU, which is the emergency treatment unit or center, um, is a no-go area. <laughs> because as an auditor, you have to choose between whether you have to go and examine, you know, those who are sick at that point and the risks of being infected and the support that needs to go there versus saving the lives um, that obviously have to uh, be taken care of. So all these reforms and questions have to be asked at every given point in time. And we have to do a lot of scenario planning to ensure that we are actually addressing these risks on a continuous uh, basis. You, we cannot, um, as PFM actors, as stakeholders, um, do things in isolation. In the design and targeting of policies and programs and everything, we need to involve all key stakeholders. Private sector must be involved. The donor agencies must be involved. Um, in most jurisdictions, and Ghana is not an exception, there are presidential tax forces, you know, within the office of the president, you know, there are coordinating, uh, crisis coordinating units set up across various areas to control, to distribute, and to support um, those who have been impacted by this um, uh, pandemic. And therefore, it is critical that stakeholders, civil so, uh, society organizations, internal and external auditors of supreme institutions, private you know, uh, audit firms, uh, public accounts committees, uh, public interest um, um, committees, etc., will have to be involved right from day one. So as to ensure that the various programs are responding to the various needs and we are public financial management policies and programs that are addressing the societal needs of those who have been what, impacted as a result of this uh, pandemic. Governments and PFM actors, I think uh, two speakers made it clear, technology, technology, technology is not going to go away. So countries, some countries are using uh, e-procurement platform to track and manage emergency spending. In Ghana, I think there's a pilot um, ongoing for e-procurement um, 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 uh, arrangement to make sure that, yes, you can submit all your procurement you know, online. You don't have to know, see anybody. It goes through the process, and then you get your um, uh, award. Countries like Rwanda, for instance, you know, already have implemented this and I think it's working very well with them. Um, 
firms are using drone technology to observe stock count. In Ghana, I think um, the Ministry of Health signed up to this zip line uh, to, of course, provide uh, medical you know, products or supplies to places that are difficult to sort of reach. Um, we had to activate mobile money, um, which of course we have been using over the period, but incentives had to be given to a lot of um, telcos to be able to waive certain um, uh, charges to allow citizens to be able to what, use um, mobile um, um, technology or use digital means uh, to make payments, uh, mobile money, etc. So these reforms plus a lot more around the education side which uh, colleagues you know um, did mention because public sector financial management experts and trainings are not going to be uh, the same trainings are going to be in, in forums like this if had not been uh, possibly if this had not been covered possibly i'll be standing in front of you uh, doing this lecture and interacting with you but things have changed and therefore there's really a lot of investment that is going to um, into public financial management at all levels, across the accounting, across the auditing arrangement. And it's important that we stay engaged in this area, upscale, and ensure that we are actually uh, part of the whole uh, change management uh, process. So to end, I'm quoting the IMF that is saying that governments stakeholders everybody should do whatever it takes but they should keep the receipts thank you very much thank you very much uh this morning i was uh on another seminar with uh, ghana integrity initiative looking at covid 19 and the issues of transparency and accountability and um, some of the very important points you, you just made came up. But I love that one. Do whatever you can do, but make sure you keep the receipts. We, we will come <laughs> for the receipts. <laughs> Tell us stories. There is no stories of oh, a, um, either a tsunami or a flood has taken the receipts away. <laughs> we will have to keep the receipts. So thank you very much. Um, um, uh, Mr. Waje, for this excellent presentation. We have questions already for you on the platform, and I'm going to put two questions from um, Felix Amache. Felix Amache is a final year PhD student. Um, he's in public administration, so you will understand why he's interested in. Mm. So what, um, what will be your opinion on corruption and the fight against COVID-19? To what extent could public officers be accused of financial malfeasance or misappropriation in the fight against corruption. And this question comes, keeps coming up also this morning, it came up whether or not, like you said, in an attempt to save lives, um, can I be said to be <laughs> reckless? <laughs> save lives, you know, few lives were at stake and all of that. But I guess that the do whatever you can do, but keep the receipts, you know, it's a big blow to that question. But, but let me leave you to answer the question, please. <laughs> I should probably have said it. So, the, 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 well, uh, I can say that based on the Ebola outbreak, okay, post Ebola, um, there were a lot of audit reports that, you know, came up. Sierra Leone, Liberia, and most of, you know, most West Africa, you know, countries. And it was clear that millions of dollars were lost through this whole, um, in, in this whole pandemic. And why were they lost? One, clearly the controls, like I mentioned, um, were either non-existence, and then where they exist, the special arrangement or special provisions that needed to be documented to make sure that in instances where we are setting aside a certain process to be able to, of course, um, uh, procure a certain item or to sort of um, incur on a certain sort of transaction. It's clearly documented and whatever or whoever was charged with governance or charged with that particular arrangement 
is aware of that and sign up to that. And therefore, if the Supreme Audit um, institutions come after you, the rule of the game is evidence. So if you don't have the evidence, clearly you are out. There were clear instances um, in those reports that monies were being disbursed to friends, people were creating fictitious you know, accounts and diverting you know, uh, funds to their own sort of um, um, you know, bank accounts. And these, these are public you know, um, information. Um, if you look at the Auditor General's report for Sierra Leone on Ebola and even for that one, the one for Liberia, including other forensic audits that were done. But my point about corruption, my comment about you know, um, transparency is that the conclusion I made that we cannot say we will not do anything in this situation. Things have to move. Medical supplies have to move. Monies have to move to poor people that have been heavily impacted as a result of this. So there are a lot of cash transfers that happens. But as a country, and in most, let's say, um, least developed countries where weak PFM systems exist, is that data is not available. And I brought the point on EFSAS. There are no international standards that most of these entities are following. So no data is even available to be able to use it as a basis to make informed decisions. So for us, for example, if we are saying that we disperse money to 100 you know, people who were impacted because they were in a database or they were part of people who are underprivileged, there's practically no source. There's practically no information that can tell us that these are really the people based on which these disbursements were made. So the corruption will come because there is an opportunity for people to take advantage of that. And the opportunity can only be addressed where there are stronger controls in place. And like I said, where those controls do not um, exist or where those controls need to be, of course, um, bypassed, there are clear reasons or justifications why a certain process or procedure is being sort of waived because of this emergency. In the absence of that, um, clearly there would and there is going to be a lot of you know, um, issues about corruption, misapplication, and mismanagement of funds post-COVID. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a Han Galaxy 10 a10s okay uh, uh adam osman great adam osman uh okay, um i would like to know to what extent the covid 19 affects the medium-term economic framework of ghana mm. <laughs> so as we may be aware um from a policy planning perspective um, this is where we are obviously hit. Um, the finance minister had come in with a projection of uh, growth of, um, I think for Ghana, it's about 6.3 you know, uh, or 6.8 there about. As we speak, the fear is that we may go close to 1.5, drop from that level. If we compare us to other West Africa or ECOWAS countries, in fact, most of them are registering already negative growth. So coupled with the fact that, yes, we are dropping in revenue, etc., cetera, um, for the next you know, three years, it's really GDP growth, and for that matter, macroeconomic stability, if nothing changes, is really going to be very, very, very uh, serious. Um, and it's gonna have a very serious impact on the economy. 
possibly the finance minister may have to come back again um you know to give us all the scenarios but clearly yes um it's going to have a very very strong impact and if nothing that doesn't sort of change we should be looking at within in the next two to three years um countries really crawling um into negative growth and then um we'll get to the recovery efforts uh, but until that yes this really i agree it's going to have a serious effect on us on our macroeconomic uh, policy overall uh sabino, sabino has a question he says with COVID-19 having impact on every country's finance, access to external borrowing to, fi to finance the budget deficit becomes difficult. However, the alternative of domestic borrowing is also very real. From your perspective, what advice would you have for the managers of the Ghanaian and other African economies in terms of raising funds to finance the exceptional COVID-19 related expenditure? Okay, that's a good question. <laughs> and that's why I like interacting <laughs> with, with academia. And as is, I don't want to put myself in the shoes of um, the Minister of Finance at this point. <laughs> um, that is the sleepless night for almost every, I'll say, finance minister and public uh, financial management player. What we have not Done well for ourselves as a country, okay? Um, as the efforts that we have not actually put on our domestic, you know, um, uh, revenue mobilization, you know, in the past. Currently, like we all know, wherever you are living now, I doubt you pay property tax. Yeah, okay? that's a big one. <laughs> We don't. We don't pay. As we speak now, the informal sector, based on uh, you know last year's um, you know budget highlights as a firm, account for more than sixty to seventy percent of our you know tax revenue. But we, I mean, not tax um, and tax revenue. But we are not. They are not there for us to go and collect and get them on board. So these practices have gone with us for, for you know, a while. And I know that uh, both the, the tax authorities and you know, um, the non-tax revenue units within the Ministry of Finance and all the GRAs and all the various um, revenue mobilizations are trying to find ways um, to get this on board. So it's not rosy for anybody at this point, but on the side, some commodities like you know gold is obviously doing well. I think I know that we obviously um, uh, had a, a, an aggressive you know stance uh, to try and get that sector also you know clean up to make it more um, um, vibrant. So it is a tough one. Uh, it is difficult. Um, if you ask me, I don't have immediate answers as to where to get the money. <laughs> but like I did present it, um, the international community are cognizant of this. And therefore, the port has been made available uh, for countries. The Gene, uh, 7 J20 um, did mention clearly that, look, they are even going to, of course, um, cut some debt, you know, um, uh, get some countries to, to um, have debt reliefs. And, but then there, were, there are conditionalities. You have to obviously make sure that you have a strong plan to spend these in these three sectors of health, education, and social sort of protection. So if, and granted, we can do and respond to that and have the capacity to be able to develop all the various uh, tools to assess those funds. That can help us, at least cushion us a bit, because we were supposed to, of course, pay the, you know, make do with the interest payment, et cetera. So that, of course, will give us some kind of fiscal space to be able to sort of um, attend to some key um, uh, uh, sectors within, within our economy. Uh, but I, I agree, these, these areas, 
are difficult because everybody is stretched um, <laughs> at this point. I don't know whether I've answered your question correctly. <laughs> you have, you have. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's a tough one because the reality is that, I mean, even um, resources that have been made available would depend on how robust country systems are to be able to assess them. So if okay. country systems, if country systems are not robust, uh, your your transparency and and accountability systems are very weak, you probably would have difficulty assessing some of these uh, monies. And and these monies also come in tranches. So you you may get the first tranche, and your uh, disbursement indicators, disbursement linked indicators. If you don't meet them, you are unable to access further tranches of the money. So even though you may have approvals it may be difficult for you to be able to get all of the money that has been earmarked for you. And so I think that um, that's a very important conversation about how Ghana can leverage on resources uh, to, to finance post-COVID reconstruction and recovery. Um, Nana says, we can look at expenditure management of non-core government businesses. Okay, so um, I don't know whether you want to make a comment on that, and then we'll bring the conversation to a close. I'm not so sure what um, uh, you mean so by maybe. expenditure management of non-core government business. Mm -hmm. no, well, I mean, it, it, uh, it's <laughs> also political. So, and we are in an election year, so mm -hmm. what is core and what is non-core is determined by the politician, right? <laughs> Yeah, and and you know clearly um, it's about the priorities, and I, like I did mention um, in the policy perspective, um, what are the priorities um, at this moment, and what are the things that you know keep governments and uh, PFM uh, practitioners awake. So you cannot, for example, uh, shift anything of health to any other area. That is at this point, a no-no. Um, social protection, you will not, and you cannot sort of play around it. Um, the aspect of non-core, well, roads, will you say road, for example, maybe non-core, but depending on the resources available, it may be an avenue uh, for also a revenue generation. Remember, Ghana and like most other um, African countries heavily rely on agriculture. Food security in this COVID-19 era um, is clearly as, you know, it, uh, as, has come up as a very big risk for everybody. And therefore, yes, if you have some um, access to finance that seeks to expand rules in various agriculture areas and therefore you can get, you know, the food in and obviously the food basket and get everybody sort of um, okay clearly uh, if uh, literally as my local language will say if people are fed and they are satisfied um, i think everybody is at peace so you once you are not going to bed empty stomach i think it is an, a, a sign of even peace and stability in any country so I think, yes, what becomes core and non-core, and with respect to expenditure management, um, the actors and public financial managers at this point, it is clearly a top priority, but you cannot ignore certain, at least these three for now, health, social protection, education, clearly um, is consuming a lot, and agriculture, uh, for if, if I may add, is consuming a lot um, of, of expenditure at this point. So you would, no, nobody, parliament may not even uh, give you that approval uh, to spend on things that really doesn't address or uh, matter to, to us as citizens. Um, Mr. Baji, that's, uh, um, hmm, I think we should close now. It's... <laughs> Yes, Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to end the session now. I have two important questions. One is talking about local government and how we can assure uh, we can prevent procurement fraud at the local level. 
the other one is talking about how what going into the future what pfm mechanisms we can put uh, in place uh, for future uh, pandemics I, I guess that your conversation has addressed some of the last question but in one minute do you want to say anything else before i draw the curtains well thank you very much uh, prof um i must say that pfm is broad very broad like um we are seeing in terms of all this, you know, C series. So clearly, uh, I appreciate the fact that we cannot address all the issues here. Um, maybe we just uh, sort of deliberation. We can take maybe one, you know, one by one uh, the various sort of elements and actually go into details. Um, but what I want to say is that yes, once again. Um, to thank all of you, uh, to thank the participants, you know, um, who sacrificed, I'll say, their, uh, um, you know, nights uh, to be um, on board and to listen to me, who being the last presenter. Um, but I think that this, like you said, is the start, is the beginning of the conversation we should obviously have. Um, we need to deliberately in our various organizations I think be agents of change and champions um, in the areas of uh, financial reporting, in the areas of uh, transparency, and in the areas of accountability. It is the most difficult thing, especially in, in public financial management to do. Uh, but then we as professionals, we are as those in academia, who the citizenry that sort of uh, duty to ensure that sanity is brought into all aspects of the dealings in the public sector and in the public financial management as a whole, from the policy level up to external audit level. So I want to thank you all for, for your time. And it was great interacting with you. But I look forward to uh, future collaboration and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hefron. Uh, Abwaji uh, works with PwC and uh, is in charge of the uh, public sector financial uh, management wing of the work of PwC. Earlier, we had Dr. Nanaya Simpson, head of accounting uh, in the business school. And earlier, we had Professor George Ma um, uh, joining us from Quinnipiac University in the USA. We have had uh, Mr. David Ajemai uh, joining us from, from Germany, and we have uh, a few colleagues joining us from the US. Um, and I know that there are a lot of us also who have joined from other parts of the world. I want to say thank you to all of you. Um, first, to our presenters who have spent their evening sharing knowledge with us. The essence of this seminar series are uh, to ensure that we can shape practice and policy. And I want to urge you, uh, those of you students and uh, practitioners out there, to continue the conversations that have been started here. Uh, on Thursday, we would have another session. Uh, as I said, uh, the head of uh, civil service, Nana Jamina, would be speaking to us on how COVID-19 has impacted the delivery of public services. Uh, and then we will be joined from the US um, uh, by Professor uh, Kendra Stewart, who is the president of the American Public Administration Association. And these two will be speaking to us next week, and I want to urge you to join. But this evening, I want to thank all of you for making time to join us, and I wish you a very pleasant evening. The UGBS will continue to traverse the boundaries of sharing knowledge, and I'm happy that a lot of our students and um, faculty have joined. Our PhD students from public administration, I want to salute you, uh, Leonard and Felix and all of your friends. Thank you for joining. And please encourage a lot of your colleagues to join in subsequent sessions. I'll give you all a good night. Thank you, my lecturer, uh, Dr. Francis Awadiwachri, uh, for spending the evening with us. I appreciate all of you faculty members, and I wish you a pleasant evening. I'll see you tomorrow, those of you who are around. And please continue with the good work you are doing. Amen. I